All right. Um, so Tang Dynasty architecture. <coughs> um, <coughs> one of the major achievements um, is the construction in large scale in pure wooden architecture. Um, large interior spaces without the rammed earth platform um, inside. So whatever you see from exterior, the scale, the size, um, the grandeur actually indicate the scale of actual architectural space inside. And this is also testified by, <coughs> even though they didn't survive, um, you know, the, the, the ruin, the sites left today, um, still <coughs> testify the great scale of Tang Dynasty wooden architecture, like in this um, Longman, um, you know, Long, Longman Cave. <clears throat> the actual wooden structure survived from Tang Dynasty are all in small scale. Right? They are, you know, all those big ones had been destroyed, you know, partially due to the material. Of course, you know, wood was very easy to, to destroy. Um, <clears throat> very few actual wooden halls survived from the Tang Dynasty and the main hall of Nanchan Si Monastery is one of them. So this is the earliest extant uh, wooden structure uh, in China. It was completed in 782 um, based on a inscription on a purling um, under the roof. It says this is, you know, built at a certain year of a certain era uh, of an empress reign. And that translates to <coughs> um, the modern date as 782 CE. <coughs> it is survived partially because of its you know, small scale, because in Chinese history, there were many waves of persecution of Buddhism. And during the Buddhist persecution, um, Buddhist temple, especially those famous one, were deliberately burned and destroyed. But some of the small one, because they are so small, they are, they are neglected. Um, are not not worth to be to be destroyed, <coughs> and um, it also survived because it is not an urban temple, you know, not in a big city, so not many people know about it. Not many people go there. Um, it's in Mount Wu Tai. Um, this is one of the four major, you know. Buddhist sacred land in China. And um, these are the place for um, pilgrimage. And it's in the mountain uh, in Shanxi province. So it was a small, a minor structure during Tang Dynasty. And uh, before the major persecution of Buddhism, um, it survived. <clears throat> and today it is, it is, um, priceless. The first major kind of a persecution of Buddhism or called the destruction of Buddhism was during the Huichang era of Emperor Wu of Tao. Now this is Emperor Wu, not Empress Wu. Um, Empress Wu was a enthusiastic Buddhist supporter, but Emperor Wu um, more than a century 
after Empress Wu um, was a was a Taoist, and he actually persecuted uh, Buddhism, and that happened in the year 845. And this building was constructed before that, but it survived because of its kind of minor uh, status. <clears throat> the building um, was constructed in wood. It was a three bay structure featuring a hip and gable roof. So we are going to look at Chinese roof a little bit later. And it has the characteristic Tang Dynasty uh, features of the kind of a um, gently curved um, eaves and uh, far reaching uh, roofs. So the roofs project from the wall very far away. That is a characteristic of, of Tang Dynasty um, architecture. It protrude as long as much as the width of a bay. So if you look at the bay and look at how much the roof projected out, it is just as long as a base width. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, the roof decoration is very similar to what we have seen in the you know, Tang Dynasty painting and earlier, right? Um, you know, from the age of disunion, um, those paintings on the wall, as well as, you know, some models survived from the tomb <coughs> indicate the ridge. Um, the end of the ridge were decorated by kind of a, um, a bird tail like feature uh, known as the, the owl's tail. Uh, <clears throat> so it is confirmed as a tongue structure, both in its major um, formal feature as well as the uh, documentation um, on the building itself. <clears throat> the skeleton of the building consists of um, the vertical columns and the columns were strengthened by tie beams, right? You can see here we have the column and this beam is no, not load bearing. It is called a tie beam. It was to connect the column and to stabilize the grid of the columns before the structure above it were, um, were put on, right? First, you create a stable um, network of columns and these tie beams were to secure those columns in their position. So during later construction, they are not going to shift, uh, uh, shift off position. <coughs> so not the load bearing. Um, and then the dogong or brackets are located directly on top of the column. And uh, the, the real load bearing beam are supported by the brackets, right? So on top of the brackets, there are the beams. So here we have these, these beams. And um, the beams support, support purlins, and then the purlins support rafters, right? So these rafters. So this drawing is without the indication of, of rafters. So that <coughs> horizontally layered uh, roof structure, <coughs> its roof is called the hip and gable roof because you know, from the skeleton of the structure, you can see very clearly the lower part, four slope, right? So these are uh, hip to roof, but the upper part, you see this upper part, there is a vertical gable. So the upper part 
is a gable roof. The lower part is a four slope hip roof. So this combination of hip and the gable roof is known as the xie shan, right? <coughs> that translated as hip and gable, an equivalent uh, to the hip and gable roof in um, the English language. Um, to remind you the um, similarity and the difference between this town structure and the Northern Way images carved into stone um, from the Buddhist caves, um, the, that roof decoration, the owl's tail roof decoration, and the um, the rafters and beams. <coughs> One major difference, so those are the similarities. One major difference is in the brackets. <coughs> so <coughs> in this facade, from an earlier age, it looks that the brackets are only parallel to the wall, not projecting out, so that the roof <coughs> cannot actually be projected very far from the wall. So in another word, <coughs> the images in this carving shows only brackets along that direction, but not the projecting cantilevered one like that, right? But Tang Dynasty structure, typically they have that projecting um, arm <clears throat> perpendicular to the wall. And that allowed them to project the eave um, farther away from the wall. <coughs> so <clears throat> the wall constructed in bricks <coughs> are not load bearing. They are just um, kind of a filling in the space between the, um, the wooden skeleton. The main hall belonged to a monastery. Right? So this is the, the main hall from Tang Dynasty. Other structures were built in a later period. So not all of them are Tang Dynasty structure. <coughs> but on the same, on the side of older structures. So the plan of the monastery reflect the Tang Dynasty um, layout of, of a Buddhist temple. <coughs> um, the Nan the, the main hall is a three by three bay square building which is kind of unusual because typically a Chinese building is rectangular and with the long side along the east-west dimension. So the, the main face uh, face south. <coughs> this building, the orientation is also self-oriented. So that is north, you know, more or less um, facing south you know, considering this is in a mountain, <coughs> that is, that orientation is, is good enough for a southern preferred orientation. A square building, three by three bays, um, you count the bay by counting the column, right? So four columns on each side, so each side is three bay. <coughs> Even though the building is, is small, nonetheless, it is the biggest building in the complex because this is a main hall. Um, it, is, look, it is the largest, it is also the most important building in the whole Nanchan Si Monastery. 
the status of the hall is not only indicated by its size and scale, but also by its location. It is um, located at the end of the north-south axis that started with a stair and a gate. And that axis was formed by, by symmetrically placed accompanying buildings. <coughs> so two buildings located on each side, each of the east-west side, facing each other, and together they define a central, central axis. And those side bays were dedicated to uh, minor Buddhist deities, while the central one was dedicated to, to Buddha. <coughs> um, and there is um, another a, a service courtyard, um, you know, where the uh, the monks live and conduct more private kind of daily activities. So its location is also significant. It's right on the central axis. And its stat status was also indicated by its height. So it's the biggest. It is also standing on the highest ground for the whole monastery, right? So it's elevated on an additional platform <coughs> in addition to the or, or already raised ground for the whole monastery. Um, again, each individual building in Chinese architecture does not um, <clears throat> qualify as a kind of architectural work. It is the complex organized by courtyard that, um, that is comparable uh, to, a, to a piece of poetry, to um, an essay. And, um, and that is a that is an important thing to keep in mind. So, so when we are looking at an individual building like that, always uh, be aware, you know, it belong to a um, a group of buildings, and they together create a a kind of uh, spatial um, experience and a spatial uh, mood. Once again, um, you know, if, if we compare to, to earlier um, wooden architecture as suggested in the Buddhist carvings, um, we should be able to notice both similarities and differences. <coughs> in, this con in this case, we are comparing with um, cave number 30 from Mount Maiji, that is, you know, we looked at it um, in the lecture on the age of disunion, <coughs> similarities <coughs> include um, the roof decoration, you know, the wooden structures, etc. But in this case, um, the the greatest difference is in the bracket, right? So, <coughs> in the earlier example, there wasn't even a bracket. There is just a big block. Just to the dou, there wasn't even a gong. Gong means arm, and the dou means block, right? <laughs> so I think it is safe to say the bracket system was um, advanced in the Tang Dynasty, and uh, that, um, that advancement made in the um, design and uh, diversification of brackets contributed to the structural stability of wooden structure in Chinese architecture. And also um, the result is that, um, you know, large scale uh, pure wooden structure became possible, right? So the bracket 
um, was a major contribution to the development of Chinese wooden um, structure, the architectural carpentry. <laughs> and we will look at the um, function of bracket in, um, in some later lectures. A second building from Tang Dynasty we are going to look at is called the Fu Guang Si, <coughs> the Fu Guang Monastery. <coughs> um, again, the main hall survived from the Tang Dynasty. All other structures in the same, same uh, monastery uh, were built in a later eras. Um, the main hall was built in 875, the year 875. Um, it's also in Mount Wutai um, in, in Shanxi province. This one is a middle rank building. <coughs> its status is higher than the Nanchan Si monastery. Uh, <coughs> while Nanchan Si was not even mentioned, was not mentioned at all in any Tang record or Tang literature, Fu Guang Si was recorded as one of the 10 great monasteries of Wu Tai. And um, it also featured in some murals um, from the Buddhist cave at, at Dunhua. So it was a famous building uh, it was not the highest rank, however, it was significant. And um, um, this middle rank, uh, Fu Guang Si, <coughs> um, its higher status can be observed in, in many aspects. <coughs> Such a significant building survived from Tang Dynasty because it was, even though it was a Tang structure, it was after the destruction of Buddhism during the Huichang era under Emperor Wu of Tang. Um, so if it was built before that, probably it, it would also have been, you know, burned. Um, the roof style for this building is a pure hipped roof, right? There's no kind of a vertical gable, a ridge and then four slope. And it is also a much larger building than Nan Chan Si. While Nan Chan Si is a um, three by three bay hall, and this one is a seven by four bay, right? Seven bay along the east-west dimension and four bays along the north-south dimension. <laughs> um, like Nan Chan Si, Fu Guang Si, the main hall, was also um, part of a kind of a, you know, architectural ensemble. Um, similarly, its significance is testified by its, its scale, its location, its elevation of height, and uh, being at the end of the central north-south axis and being accompanied by side buildings <coughs> and side courtyards, right? So that's the, the main building. And this is the monastery. Uh, and its height was quite elevated. And this is partially because of the mountain topography, right, constructed in a mountain. <coughs> that great height was not entirely constructed. Um, the natural uh, ground raised toward the back, toward that, the main hall. So it was, it was partially a result of the selection of the site. So the site was chosen and uh, <coughs> so that it, it has that kind of a feature to, to highlight um, 
to highlight the main hall. Um, now, when we put Nanchan Si and the Fo Guang Si, the main halls, next to each other, we notice the hierarchy in uh, Chinese architecture. Hierarchy is basically considered as a feature of Confucian um, thinking um, on Chinese art and architecture. <coughs> However, in Buddhist monastery, when they were built in a Confucian society, they also need to observe those social norms. So different monastery um, belong to different ranks um, due to their you know, sponsorship. And um, you know, those imperial, imperially sponsored monastery, um, being it a monastery constructed in the capital city Chang'an, or a Buddhist cave carved into the mountain at the eastern capital of Luoyang, those belong to the highest rank. <coughs> While those small temples in villages uh, built by the, um, the villagers, uh, those are uh, low in status and often small in scale. Well, different uh, levels of uh, administration um, or officials might sponsor um, those middle, middle ranks. <coughs> and those monasteries were um, also classified later in, um, in historical document, uh, class, classify them into different ranks. So here the ranks um, difference between these two uh, surviving Tang structures are quite um, obvious. The two facades are drawn to the same scale, right? So they were pretty much on the, um, on the same scale. So in, in, in this case, you know, each of those small, small bar indicate a meter, right? So that's, that's one meter. That's one meter. So they are to the same scale. <coughs> so obviously, Fo Guangsi's scale, its size is much bigger than Nan Chan Si. And secondly, um, Fo Guangsi has more base. Um, and uh, you know, thirdly, the brackets for Fo Guangsi is much more complicated than Nan Chan Si. It has more layers. And uh, it also has greater uh, complexity. And while Nan Chan Si um, has only brackets on top of columns, there's no intercolumnar brackets. Fu Guang Si has not only brackets on top of column, but also brackets in between columns, those intercolumnar uh, brackets. <laughs> and fourthly, um, decorations on Fo Guang Si is also more complicated. For example, the, um, the tail decoration here is very simplistic with only a few lines to indicate the curve. <laughs> While at Fo Guang Si, great detail were carved into this beast head like um, tail. So there's not only a tail, but also some kind of a face um, carved into it um, and uh, um, much more detail. Um, also the ridge, while the Nan Chan Si Monastery, the ridge is a, has a simple end. Fo Guang Si, the ridge was also decorated by figurative ceramic 
uh, parts, right? So all those suggest a higher grade. Um, and finally, the roof style, those are hierarchical, right? Um, we know this is called the hip and gable roof, and this is the pure hip roof. In the Chinese architectural convention, the pure hip roof belong to a higher um, level than the hip and gable roof. So this kind of majestic purity um, is a symbol of high status. And um, according to later architect, later regulation from the Ming Dynasty, for example, the pure hip to roof cannot be used by imperially sponsored architectural project. Uh, we don't know the specific regulation from Tang Dynasty, but we do know from the Ming Dynasty, which is much later than Tang, that this pure hip to roof can only be used by the emperor um, and uh, you know his residence, his palace, um, the monastery, you know, associated with the emperor. So pure hip to roof was not something one can choose as a stylistic preference. You must have that social status to be allowed to use this kind of pure hip to roof. And uh, even the hip and gable roof were not as accessible to commoner. Um, it is a princely kind of roof style. Princely residents from the Ming Dynasty can use hip and gable roof. Um, <clears throat> and the common folks were only allowed to use simple kind of pure gable roof. Uh, so um, roof style is another indicator of, of hierarchy in traditional Chinese architecture. Now, the section, from the section, we see more clearly um, the structural logic of Chinese architecture, <laughs> right, column, and this is the tie beam. This is tie beam. On top of column, we have brackets, and the bracket support the real beam, right? Here, here, and here. Those are the beam. The beam support purlin. The purlin support rafter. Right? So those kind of um, layering, um, layering up. Um, <clears throat> So from the section, um, you can also understand the complexity of the brackets are different. While the um, Nan Chansi Monastery has two layers of bracketing, you know, how to calculate those layers, the Chinese actually use another word. The Chinese use the word tiao to refer to the layer, the layer of brackets. Tiao means jump. So you have one jump, two jump, yi tiao, liang tiao. So this is considered a two jump um, bracket. How to calculate that? The easiest way is to find the, you know, um, the purlin, the eve purlin. This is the eve purlin. And uh, to count how many layers horizontally in between the eve purlin, that is the purlin, to support the rafters for the eave. And um, the central 
point of the column uh, of the wall or the column and count how many how many um, steps it project out. And in this case, you know, it's one step and two step. So that's that's two jump. One jump, two jump, right? Whatever is beyond that, that don't count. Those are decoration. Right? So, <clears throat> so that one is a two jump bracket, uh, pretty simplistic. And the four guang si, no, this, I'm sorry. This is the Eve Perlin, and this is the middle of the wall. You know, how many jump are there? One, two, three, and four. So this is a four jump. So because the members are not because sometimes it's horizontal, sometimes it's diagonal. So it might be confusing to count these vertical layers, <coughs> but it's uh, much more clear to count this way, how many jump. And when there are four layer of this jump, it's also four layer vertically because you know this is one layer, this is the second layer, this is the third layer, and that is the fourth layer. So the third and the fourth layer are diagonal. The first and second are horizontal. But when you count that, um, it is more consistent, right? So that is, um, you know, in the Chinese terminology, in, in, the, in the terminology of Chinese architectural carpentry, uh, the way uh, referring to the complexity of a bracket, you use the term jump, tiao to count the layers of those brackets. So it's the same thing here, right? So count, count between the, purlin, the eave purlin and the middle of the wall. So it's, it's one, two, three, and four, uh, four jump. And this is a um, cut away perspective drawing for the Fo Guang Si. Monastery. And here I wanted to introduce another terminology. One is called um, stealing heart construction, to xin zao. Another is called counting heart um, construction, ji xin zao. <laughs> Both of them refer to the brackets, right? Brackets. Uh, what is a to xin zao? So this would be considered a to xin zao or um, stealing heart. What is a ji xin zao, counting heart? This would be considered a counting heart. Stealing heart, now, you know, take a few seconds to look at them. Um, what are the difference between these two brackets? This one, all the brackets are projecting in one direction. That is perpendicular to the wall from which the project, uh, the, uh, the, the bracket project out without crossing bars. But this one, you know, the lower two layers were pretty much like that one, but the upper two layers were different. They have the crossbars. So the brackets not only project perpendicularly to the wall, but also having arms parallel to the wall. So that is counting hard. Um, and that is stealing hard like those were being stolen. So basically the, the joint is considered as a heart. If you, from the heart, you have the crossing bars added, that is counting. If there's no crossing bar, that's stealing. Right? So these are kind of those terminology. Now you can see here in this exterior bracket, um, 
the first two jumps, right? So now, you know, we are using the Chinese terminology, Chinese, you know, very specialized uh, carpentry term terminology. The first two jumps were stealing heart and the upper, um, the third and the fourth jumps are counting heart. So it's, um, um, you know, when you, when you speak like that for someone who, who didn't study um, Chinese architectural history, that's, that's absolutely nonsense, right? But um, that's what it means, right? So first two jumps, stealing heart, and the third and fourth jumps, counting heart. That is um, very common for exterior. In general, Tang Dynasty structure from, for the exterior brackets, so these are exposed to air, so those are um, exterior bracket, bracketing, are very often contained counting heart, while the interior brackets are usually stealing heart. And that is, that is a common feature of Tang Dynasty Chinese architecture. <clears throat> Um, shows that the similarity between the actual Tang structure and those uh, imageries from Tang painting. So I'm going to show you very briefly um, a few kind of Tang structures and um, um, it, and five dynasties structures. The five dynasties was a uh, you know when the Tang Empire collapsed in the year 907, um, China was split into many smaller schemes and uh, um, uh, ma many smaller uh, regimes. <coughs> and that period was called the Five Dynasties. Um, it was from uh, 907 to 960. So that's a period of Five Dynasties. And Zheng Guo Si was, um, was from the five dynasties, right? So that's the, um, the Zheng Guo Si Monastery. And this is our old friend, Nan Chan Si. So what I'm going to, to, the point I want to make is, well, the, the tendency was um, more and more structure were constructed in the um, kind of a counting heart, um, brackets, right? So <clears throat> the, the uh, Tang structure from the eighth century, again, here at Nan Chan Si, the first jump is stealing heart. The second jump is counting heart. But if you look at Zheng Guo Si, it is a small structure just like Nan Chan Si, so this is also um, just a three bay structure, but it's, it's a um, bracket, it's, it's much, more, um, much more complicated. Um, it has more layers and um, it, a minor structure was using a four jump bracket. Uh, bracket. So um, you, can, you can count from here, that's one jump, two jump, three jump, four jump. So um, Zheng Guo Si Monastery is, um, is, is quite unusual, quite bizarre, because usually for such a small three base structure, uh, you wouldn't want to use um, that complicated a bracket system. You know, it is, it is like, um, a, a seven-year-old um, kid wearing a super big hat, something like that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we do have this example from the five dynasties, probably because during the period when China was in chaos, all those architectural standard and the regulation were not uh, being followed. So we have a combination of super complicated bracket with 
a small building uh, because we know usually that four jump um, is for something much bigger, like Fu Guangsi, you know, seven bay. But Zheng Guosi is like a combination of a structure like that with a complexity of bracket like that. So it was a bizarre example, but it exists. Another building from the five dynasties um, is called Da Yuan Yuan. And this one, again, we are going to be very brief to look at it, but I, I wanted to make another point in terms of architectural history. So that Da Yuan Yuan monastery built in the five dynasties, 938. So it's uh, from the 10th century. And uh, when we compare uh, Da Yuan Yuan, versus Nan Chan Si. Um, their scales are very similar. Da Yuan Yuan, the plan is 11.8 meter by 10.1 meter. And the Nan Chan Si is 11.75 meter by 10 meter. So they are almost exactly the same size and exactly the same style you know, three bay by three bay, elevated on platform. Again, I'm going to give you like a few seconds to, to look at the difference. The difference <clears throat> is, is in the roof. You might notice if you draw a line, you know, I deliberately put these two slides the eave line about the same level. But look at the ridge. Da Yuan Yuan, the ridge is much higher. Now, in this pair of examples, the point I want to make is from the early age to the later age, from Ta since Tang Dynasty, in general, Chinese roof become higher and higher. Early Tang Dynasty uh, roofs are usually very low. Their ridge were not raised as high as the later examples. But later, their ridge were raised to a higher um, position and their roofs were um, much um, higher pitched. Um, the angle of the roof slope was sharper, became sharper and sharper. And the, um, at Nan Chan Si, from the courtyard, the roof is barely visible because of the slow rising of the slope. But at Da Yuan Yuan, the roof is clearly visible because it is uh, more kind of acutely kind of angled. This is more, uh, this is clearer from section, right? So you should be able to tell which one is Nan Chan Si, which one is Fo Guang Si, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Da Yuan Yuan, which one is older, which one is, is more recent, right? So this is Nan Chan Si, and this is Da Yuan Yuan. So um, because <clears throat> the Chinese roofs, were not uh, trust. Rather, you use layers of beam and purling to create that gable so that that slope was adjustable. It's all, it's just the matter of the height of the king post. So this king post or those um, posts uh, in between the beams, you adjust the height you adjust the slope. The general tendency is toward the later imperial period, the roof pitch was raised higher and higher. So those king posts and uh, the posts in between became higher. While in early and middle Tang Dynasty, um, those beams are more densely packed to create a 
slow rising roof, right? So this is the general tendency. And we can rely on these features to tell the age of a Chinese wooden hall. Now let's take a look at some um, <coughs> Chinese pagodas. Um, so we are looking at um, the pagoda, the three pagodas at uh, Dali. And there, three pagodas. One, the central one was from Tang Dynasty, but the other two were from the Song Dynasty. Um, Dali is in Yunnan province in southwest part of China. So the central Tang Pagoda and the two Song Dynasty pagodas on the side. The Tang Dynasty Pagoda has a square in plan, and the Song Dynasty Pagoda had, uh, was a octagonal plan. And this is also very typical. Tang Dynasty Pagoda usually has a square plan, and this is kind of another, um, another stylistic indicator. A comparison between the middle pagoda and the side pagodas. A couple centuries earlier than the right one. But in both cases, the profile of the pagoda create a curve, right? If you connect those, those dot uh, pointed end, you, cre you, 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 you create a, a curve. Uh, this is true for the Tang Dynasty. This is true for all Chinese pagoda. It's never to be a straight line. But one is square, another is octagonal. Um, compare the detail, <coughs> right? Um, Song Dynasty, a little, a little bit more ornate. And the wooden structure is more clearly indicated in this masonry carving. So, um, so that is another, um, another aspect I wanted to talk about. That is the classification of Chinese pagoda into different type, different style. The middle pagoda at Dali is called the Mi Yan Pagoda. Mi Yan Ta. Ta means pagoda. And Mi Yan means Den Ziv. Why is it called Den Ziv? Because it has a super tall, ground floor, while the upper floors are densely eaved. So we introduced this concept before when we were looking at the uh, age of disunion. So again, I'm um, you know, um, kind of uh, introducing this um, once again. So <clears throat> the Dali Pagoda belong to the Mian Pagoda. Well, another town structure, this one from the capital city of Chang'an, today's Xi'an, this is a low ge shi ta, right? Tower pavilion pagoda. Because all the layers are uh, similarly um, distributed throughout the whole body of the pagoda. Um, the first floor was not uh, much higher than the second. So it diminished in height gradually instead of suddenly. That's, that's a, the major feature of low ge shi ta. And uh, the pavilion looking was carved on the, uh, the masonry surface also very clearly. And it indicate, um, you know, bays, um, nine bays, um, 11 bays, and uh, diminishing to seven bays, five bays, um, et cetera. So, <clears throat> um, but uh, the columns were clearly carved there and uh, some indication of the brackets as well. So this is the famous, um, the great wild geese um, pagoda. There's also a small white geese pagoda and uh, also in the city of Chang'an, and that one was a dense eve pagoda, uh, because you know 
the first level you can see here, at least its height is like that. And it's much bigger than the second floor. Uh, so there is a sudden increase, uh, diminish of height from the second floor and above. And above that, it diminished gradually, but the first floor is super tall. Uh, that's called a density. So the big white geese, the small white geese, um, one belong to Loge Shitang, another belong to another belong to the uh, uh, the Dunsi pagoda. <coughs> um, some architectural imagery were also carved at the entrance of these pagodas, and this one is from the big wild geese pagoda at the entrance, just above the doorway. There was a carving showing Buddha and the Bodhisattvas sit seated under a building and that building is uh, a wooden structure. You find the similar um, structural logic of platforms, column and a tie beam, brackets, beam, you know, purlin, which is invisible because it's hidden and, um, um, and the rafters um, and the, uh, the owl's tail roof decoration and the uh, over turning, you know, upturning kind of a, a eaves. And also uh, <clears throat> kind of similar um, features of stealing heart at the lower level and counting heart at the upper level for the brackets. Uh, <clears throat> there were also some Dan Cheng Ta survived from the Tang Dynasty, but um, you know, I'm going to just to show you very quickly, just be aware there is a third type called a single, single story pagoda, Dan Cheng Ta. And uh, many of them um, are uh, funeral pagodas to honor the great Buddhist monks. Um, this one is not, this one is not a funeral pagoda. It has actual rooms inside, um, but the, that kind of a Dan Cheng Ta is, is um, unique, it's unusual. Most of them are funeral pagoda, like these ones. Um, so only one story, and in this case, the upper parts were considered um, decoration, right? Those are decoration. So it's considered as just, you know, one story. So it's, uh, <clears throat> so these terminologies like uh, Den's Eve, Tower Pavilion, pavilion uh, Single Story, these are just for our convenience to classify. So when we look at Chinese pagoda, we, we, we have a way to, um, to group them. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a for, for our convenience of understanding, um, but that is a um, standard way uh, in, in the field for classifying those architecture. And finally, we are going to look at um, <clears throat> an engineering marvel, um, the masonry bridge um, um, at Anji. So this Anji bridge, this is from Sui dynasty. Before the Tang dynasty, it was from the late sixth century. Um, the earliest building, uh, the earliest example um, in this lecture, in this whole lecture. <coughs> And according to local record, it was designed by um, a master builder whose name is Li Chun. And um, it is a single arched uh, masonry bridge, and which is, which is quite unusual because we know there aren't that many um, masonry building survived in, in China. And this is, this is one of them, above ground, I mean, above ground masonry building. So this one not only survived, but also survived, you know, more than 1400 years. It has a super big span in the middle. And uh, <clears throat> constructed in pure uh, stone using true arch. Um, Two additional arches 
create those um, those tunnels for the water to pass on each side. So during flooding season, when the water level rise, the water could pass the bridge safely on the two sides. And that would prevent great pressure to the, the bridge to damage its stability, um, to collapse the whole bridge. So that was um, a <clears throat> obviously a structural consideration. It also made the weight of the uh, bridge much lighter. And um, it also protect uh, the bridge from being um, destroyed by, by flood. And originally, um, they were beautifully decorated with carvings of dragons on the panel. Um, but today, those panels were relocated to museums. And on the site, there are some replicas. But uh, originally, there were also more uh, carvings on the, on the span as well, um, based on the traces left um, on the surface. Um, so it was an engineering marvel and um, from a very early age of, in Chinese architecture. Um, so again, it proved the Chinese were able to build um, arch and vault using stone, but um, uh, for some reason, they refused to adopt stone as a major architectural material for um, the house of living. Some tombs survived from Tang Dynasty further indicate that um, those masonry arch and vault structure were constructed. And uh, so here, these are the tombs and we have this barrel vault. And here we have a corbelled dome um, for um, a tomb chamber. But almost uh, consistently, almost ubiquitously, all those masonry buildings were carved with wooden structure um, details, right? So the, the stone was carved and, and uh, relieved from the wall to indicate a column, a bracket, a beam. Uh, so even though this is true masonry arches, um, it was trying to create a, a, an illusion of a living environment um, of wood to provide um, um, a after war world for the deceased, something they um, were familiar with when they were alive. <clears throat> 